Hello and welcome, once again, to a house of many doors. Alright, we're poor, and we don't have all that much to do. Alright, well, we'll do some traveling then. We'll head south. Maybe southeast, hit up whatever that place was to the northeast of the city of Masks. North northeast, oh jeez. Everything's, everything's already going to shit. There's always some lag in these segments, and I don't know what fight time. A shade core scorpiopede. It glides towards you, sleek and deadly, flying the black apple flag of the shade core enforcers. These soldiers belong to one of the most feared mercenary guilds in the house. They mostly work for the consortium, breaking the knees or skulls of debtors, and ruthlessly exterminating bandits foolish enough to ambush a protected kinetopede. Why would they come after you? Your radio coughs to life. Took a lot of work to track you down. Hand over Tybalt. His father wants him back. Is he in my crew still? Well, let's call him up from the mess hall. Get him up to speed. Trouble, Captain? Tybalt attempts to swing his rifle into his hands, but the strap knocks off his helmet and gets caught in his hair. When you explain the situation to him, he turns pale. M M my father's come for me. Oh no. Oh no. No, no, no. Oh, gods. He falls against the wall and slides to the floor, his face in his hands. Don't let them take me back, he begs. My father will be so angry. He'll put me in the thin place again. Well. Let's kick some ass. Well, we'll try. Your missile blows a crater in the floor beside the enforcers. An outraged voice crackles on your radio. Hold your fire! Muttering in the background. We don't want the boy hurt. We'll withdraw. The Scorpio Peach scuttles back into the shadows. Moments later, you hear the whiz of a grappling gun, followed by a series of thuds up on the roof above. Heavy boots clattering over your hull, heading to the doors. The enforcers didn't come here for an exchange of missiles. That risks too much harm to Tybalt. They came here for a careful extraction. I'll organize the crew to fight off the boarders. Oh. Great. You shout directions to your crew. Tybalt sits in the corner, head in his hands. The sound of a buzzsaw is screaming against metal. Your door falls away, and the black armored enforcers come roaring in like a dark tide, rifles cracking, faces hidden behind visors. One of them steps back, takes a moment to judge, hurls what looks like a rune covered iron box among your crew. It clicks open, and a torrent of shrieking ghosts pour out, flooding you in mist and unnatural terror. Ungodly cold, so ungodly cold. We'll try to rally our crew. Shit. You shout at your crew to get back into position, but your words are lost beneath the screams of a hundred ghosts. A dull pain in your thigh, you clutch at it, and your fingers come back soaked in blood. Bullets are already flying. All is almost lost. Shit. 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 Well, we'll try to fight them off. Amazing. I mentioned, I think, in part one about how difficult the skill checks are in this game. You stagger forward, but the ghosts have blinded you and the cold fear has seeped into your bones. You grope helplessly for your pistol until an enforcer's elbow hits you in the face and shatters your nose. I guess we'll take Tybalt hostage. You grab Tybalt by the hair, ignoring his yelps and shove the barrel of your pistol under his chin. Stop, you roar, and the rifle cracks cease. Stop or I blow his head off. The captain of the Shade Corn Forcers steps forward carefully. The ghost fog swirls and lifts. You're bluffing, he says. You wouldn't kill a member of your own crew. Third time's the charm. I'll really do it if you don't back off. The Enforcer Captain stares at you for a long time. 
He lifts his visor, revealing a scarred knuckle of a face. Fine, he says. Move out, boys. Nothing we can do. They file from your kinetopede silently. Their scorpiopede glides off into the shadows. Tybalt scampers off as soon as you let him go. Your crew go about their business, not meeting your eyes. Now what happens is... It, it, what happens? Now if you fail all of these... I don't know about this one. I don't think I ever took him hostage. We fail the other two. And then you surrender him. Everyone hates you. Now in this scenario, only Tybalt hates me. So I guess that's better? Oh god, now we have to talk to him? Okay. You find Tybalt in his quarters, obsessively disassembling and reassembling his rifle. As he puts his rifle back together for the fortieth time, his hand slips. Something small and probably vital drops and rolls beneath his bed. You all almost died because of me. Again. He looks ready to burst into tears. I'm useless at this. I can teach you, Tybalt. Or I can try. Tybalt smiles. Actually, I was about to ask. The rifle discharges in his hand, blowing a hole through his bookcase. Damn it! He says readily after the ringing has faded from both your ears. He sighs deeply, pulling the bookcase from the wall and inspecting the splintered hole. A pause. He sets the bookcase back down. Hey. When I say bookcase, I usually mean bookshelf. What, what do they mean in this scenario? Because that's kind of terrifying if he just... Anyway. I need to learn how to fight. I couldn't live with myself if anyone died because of my failures. I want you to take me to Fargo Keep so I can be trained by the Poet Knights. Alright, Tybalt. I'll take you to the Keep. Thank you. He returns to inspecting the newly formed bullet hole in his bookshelf. So was, was he picking up the bookshelf? Or do I just not know how to read? Oh, yeah, I forgot about this place. <sighs> kind of worthless to us right now, actually. The air hums with strange energies. The floating orb communes of the naughty doctors orbit each other overhead. Those who come to the house from other worlds are surprised to find that they can go much longer without food and drink, and even sleep is not exactly required for survival. But those who go without sleep for too long become wake-mad, and the naughty doctors come for them. The naughty doctors have no obligation to entertain guests. There is no one to greet you at the door, and no way to access the orbs overhead, which are usually forbidden to sound sleepers. No news to gain. No nothing. We got the apprehensions, though. We can use those to, slowly, ever so slowly, increase our skills. Shit. God damn it. A featureless black flag streams from the Scorpiopede's tail. You suspect that this is some mercenary crew or another, passing the time between contracts the little light banditry. The gun in the Scorpiopede's tail flashes and smokes, and a second later a warning salvo bursts bright overhead. Three hundred guineas, you hear through the radio. We'll try to flee. Okay, good. The heartlight has been doused, and your kinetopede slams into lurching, scrabbling movement. You skitter into the darkness before your enemy can react. Quick. Quick, go. Go. To the door. Go. You can't save outside of cities. I guess I should've went back to the, uh... Not a city, but I mean those locations. You know, those special locations, like Waker's Respite. 
spite. I don't care. You know what I'm talking about. Orb City. Orb fucking city, baby. <laughs> City of Engines. Do you get a guy here? Maybe. I think you can get a guy here. A city of moving metal. The air swarms with flying machines, and below them the city turns on colossal groaning cogs. Beyond the bustle and the madness, Tarwater Bay lurks, black and still as volcanic stone. Here, the impossible is routine, and even the house's tenuous laws of reality are completely suspended provided that you build a good enough machine to suspend them. My man. Let's get him. Let's get my dude. A bedraggled, white-coated man is washed up on the tarwater shore. You stumble across him lying face down in the rust-flecked sand. The young man lies in a mound of rust, oily black waves lapping at his feet. When you check his pulse, you find he's still alive, though only barely. Tarwater Bay is manned and fortified. The beach sprawls with barbed wire fence. Searchlights sweep the waves every few seconds. One beam of light lands on you and the half-drowned man, and immediately a bright figure detaches from the nearest sentry tower and flies down to investigate you. Oi! It's one of the city's rocket men, now hovering above you and spewing fire from his misshapen metal legs. He's holding a rifle in his hands. Did this fellow wash up from the tar water? I don't remember what the right answer is. There's a right answer. We'll say yes. The rocket man frowns, swaying back and forth as he wrestles for control over his unruly rocket legs. Nothing good comes from Tarwater Bay, he says. Trash shamblers, technic squid, and other half-machine abominations. I never heard of a man washing up. He glances down at the supine figure in the rust. Is he alive? This is my cousin. We've been searching for him for weeks. But it looks like he didn't make it. You let a tear drop artfully down your cheek. The rocket man coughs and awkwardly attempts to pat your shoulder. Unfortunately, he misjudges his trajectory and ends up doing a slow cartwheel instead. <laughs> I'll, uh, let you take the body back to your family, he says, upside down. My condol- <laughs> My condolences. He spins gently off into the distance. Pick up the drowned man and carry him back to the Kinetopede. Hopefully he'll recover by the time you get back. Back at the Kinetopede, Rutherford is forced to administer several blows to the ribs and a good dose of smelling salts before the half-drowned man finally wakes. He immediately spews a great volume of oily salt water across the floor of the surgery. T -t 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 terribly sorry. Apologizes the drowned man immediately, wiping oil and vomit from his mustache. Oh, oh dear. What happened? Did we build it? Let me get him up to speed. <laughs> he listens, stroking his mustache theatrically. I see. Well, thank you for pulling me out of the clutches of that nosy rocket man. You certainly saved my bacon there, so you did. Ever since I first came to the house, I've lived beneath the waves of the bay. Now I've been forced from my home, and I don't know how to return. A troublesome situation for old Dr. Delgado, wouldn't you say? <laughs> that was the fakest laugh. <laughs> There's a better one. What are you going to do? Perhaps there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Perhaps my old pal, uh... What's your name? You tell him. Perhaps my old pal can help me out once more. I'm a master scientist, able to shape technology with the slightest whim or thought. Let me join your crew as a chief engineer. I will single-handedly revolutionize your engine before I work out a way to return beneath the waves. Absolutely, you dramatic bastard. Excellent. Excellent. Dr. Delgado claps his hands together and laughs. I cannot wait to investigate your engine. Ah, I wonder what strange new technologies await me here above the water. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to vomit another six liters or so of water, he says. Dr. Delgado retreats to his new quarters, slamming his fist into his chest. Let's gather some news. 
The streets are a cacophony of competing voices. Mechanical, telepathic, human. The problem isn't finding news, it's sorting the vaguely legitimate sounding from the outright lies. Improvements to the city's cog systems will reduce congestion and confusion, claimed the assembly. The weather engines have started making it snow frozen blood. A new type of bomb has been invented, and dropped into the bay for testing purposes. Well, well. The city turns. I don't think we have anything else to do here. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll look at the stores. Oh, a building. A rickety old house from another world, dropped into this much larger house without ceremony. Its ceiling has fallen in, and rats scatter from the rubble as you approach. Well, let's go in. The door is hanging from its hinges. This one again. Gotta read it for the newcomers who start at part three. Get away. Get away. Crouched in one corner of the cottage is a scrawny man, bearded and unkempt. He stares at you with wide eyes like a startled child and aims a rifle at you with trembling hands. This must be a visitant, snatched from another world and crawled inside here for shelter from the dark. Let's see if he'll join. If he stays here, he'll be dead within days. After much gentle cajoling, the visitant finally puts down his rifle. He agrees to join your crew. He doesn't have any better options, after all. Let's, uh... Let's get a new guard. I don't think we have many of those. The visitant snaps off a smart salute and shoulders his rifle. Welcome to the crew. He gops at your kinetopede with wonder. Oh, God. It's such a crapshoot with another kinetopede, because sometimes... Sometimes it's someone who wants to... Yep. I was gonna say, sometimes it's someone who wants to fuck you over, and sometimes it's just a... Hey. <laughs> There's a graphical error. I was gonna talk more, but look at this. Look at that. Fun. Anyway. The bandit kinetopede is draped in trophies and badly fitting armor plates, doubtless looted from other victims. They demand money, and they're not polite about it. The captain makes inappropriate imi <laughs> The captain makes inappropriate intimations regarding your genealogy. Let's try and kill him because we need money. Oh, they're already unhinged, so that's good. Burn, baby, burn. Ooh, that could be bad. Who's over there? Anyone I like? No! Okay. No one's dead. We could, in theory, kill them this turn. Come on! Oh! Oh no. Please miss. Shit. I died. The game moved. Physically, the game screen moved. Okay, well, I'll, um, I'll grab Delgado and then we'll go back. We need a second gun. We'll be a lot better off when we can afford a second gun. I also just really want to replace some of the crew. Cromlick? Love Cromlick. Wouldn't trade him for anything. Rutherford? Also great. Delgado, he, he's fine. He can stay. Oh, crap. That one's fast. This could be bad. No, no, we're okay. We got it. Spire's fine. Harmony's fine. Bishop? Sucks. Tybalt? Probably gonna be done. Probably gonna be gone. Oh, this is something else. I'm sorry. I was talking. I didn't... Mm. I can't go back. I'm sorry. 
It's the abandoned building one, you know, the rats scattering, the door hanging off the hinges, etc., etc. But the, the second part's different. Inside the cottage you find an interesting tableau. Candle stubs, a faded chalk pentagram, a dozen oddly shaped skull, a jar of newts. It looks like a ritual was conducted here long ago. Perhaps some unlucky fool summoned themselves to the house by accident. We got an occultist paraphernalia and nothing else, and we're gonna fucking fight these guys, huh? We're gonna die to the bandits? Oh! No, we're not. That was not the bandits. We're good. Okay, east. No bandits this time. Fingers crossed. Don't worry about that. I know how scary that looks. Don't you worry about that. It's just the naughty doctors. Nothing to worry about. Let's check out these- let's not check out the stones. Let's actually just go as fast as we can. We might end up checking out the stones whether we want to or not. No, okay, we're just leaving then. The City of Masks. The first thing you notice is the stars twinkling just below the ceiling. A good crop this year, it seems. The second thing you notice is the noise and smoke and bustle, or rather, the lack of it. Considering its size, the city of masks is relatively sedate. There is an air of sleepy dignity. Let's gather news. We'll need to spend a few hours chatting with friendly strangers at a coffee house. Sounds delightful. Reports of discordance amongst the Shrouded Council, though details are scarce. The clergy complain of unsanctioned scripture being sold openly and without consequence. One of the stars has gone out, upsetting astrologists. Well, well. Old patterns in a new thread. Oh, we'll drop, out a pa drop off our passenger. The passenger pays what was promised and slips into the crowd. You hope whatever awaits them is better than what they left. Look at a new passenger. A hunched figure weighs you down at the station. A three-headed- Oh, Neat. A three-headed Mycena asks for safe passage to the Old Hollow. It will pay you a hundred guineas on arrival. Its eyes won't meet yours. It's trusting its life to a stranger. Let's go to the art festival. The festival has turned Giandarmo Plaza into a labyrinth of stalls and tents. Tobacanales carve sculptures from lingering cigar smoke. Face-painted art brutes vandalize the work of their neighbors. One section of the festival is devoted to watercolor depictions of other worlds. In another corner, a bewildering nightmare of transcrustacean ungeometry makes your eyes throb. Harmony slinks to the back of the plaza, begins setting up her own stall. Go and amuse yourself, she tells you. This will take a while, and I need to be alone. Let's check out the otherworldly art. In terms of composition, the paintings are much less novel than the tobacconalists or fire weavers or any of the other or any of the other dozen art schools of the art occult. Simple watercolors on simple canvas. But unlike the others, they linger in the mind. A red desert filled with rusting machines. A grinning woman on a podium, a gun pressed to her temple. Something unfathomably vast dying on a rain-swept beach. Let's return to Harmony. Harmony never mentioned that she was actually popular. Despite setting up her stall in the dingiest corner of the plaza, she has attracted a crowd of murmuring fans. She has stood at the front, handing out pamphlets. All the answers are in my manifesto, she declares. I am pioneering a new school of art occult. No name for it yet. I am sure you will all have fun inventing one. Two men with perfect hair and perfect mustaches stroll past you, flipping through the Ricketts' manifesto. Interesting in theory, of course, you hear one of them say. Let's just get to Harmony. By the time you reach the front of the crowd, an exhausted-looking Harmony is waving her hands. That's enough, she says to her audience. I'm packing up now. Go home. 
This new movement is all very well, but when will we see your next proper painting? Calls a voice from the front. Never, says Harmony to horrified gasps. I had some, but I threw them away. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks for coming. Bye! She gestures at you frantically and dashes back to the Kinetopede. When Harmony is finally back inside the Kinetopede, she slams the door behind her, breathing hard. Fans, huh? What a nightmare, she says. And now, the first place we must visit is the City of Engines. I will go and work on the blueprints. She heads back to her cabin, absent-mindedly tossing a dozen of her manifestos to one side. Let's read one. The manifesto is a rambling essay with atrocious grammar and appalling run-on sentences. It outlines a new style of artistry, making of the body a canvas, sculpting it according to hideous whims. Oh no, I've got a bad feeling in my guts. Harmony offers several rationales for her proposal. She wants to prove the beauty and abomination. She wants to destroy art world's preoccupation with art. She wants to leave art nowhere shocking left to hide, and thus force it squealing to die. The pamphlet repeats the same points over and over, worded slightly differently and spelled increasingly badly, occasionally descending into gibberish. We'll put the manifesto aside. I think that's where I'm going to call it. After the art festival, something bad happening with Harmony, Great, great, good stuff. Maybe next time we'll get to the bottom of it. Probably not, before I have to go to some weird distant corner of the map that we can't get to yet without five fucking guns. But, yeah. We'll see. We'll see what happens next time. But as always, thank you for watching, and good night.